everyone for joining us for tonight's virtual lecture, The French Arrival in the Deserted Town of Newport with Dr. Iris DeRode. I'm Elizabeth Sulak with the Newport Historical Society. We are pleased to host Dr. Iris DeRode to discuss her research regarding the French presence in Newport during the Revolutionary War, a topic that is very much her specialty. She has studied the unpublished private papers of Francois Jean de Chasteloup, Major General in the Expeditionary Army of Rochambeau. Iris earned her doctoral degree at the University of Paris 8. She has earned 13 international fellowships and presented her research at more than 30 international conferences. Her dissertation will be published in French uh, this month, in fact, and she's currently adapting her dissertation to be published in English in 2023 with the University of Virginia Press. And now I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Iris DeRoad. All right, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for this lovely introduction and for this invitation uh, to, to speak for this, uh, the event on the, or the, the French arrival of the deserted town of Newport. So thank you to the Newport Historical Society for organizing this and for your interest in, in the French, of course, in Newport. Um, something I've been working on quite a lot and I, I visited Newport about two years ago and I thought it was a, a very pretty place with lots of beautiful homes, of course. So I, I'm very happy to, to talk to you and to imagine that you all live there, or at least most of you, I, I would imagine. And I hope that I can uh, give you some new information uh, on the French in your town. And so I will discuss that today. So I will start by um, explaining to the arrival of the French in Newport, why they would call it a deserted town, but then also show you the evolution from that idea that it was deserted and um, kind of a negative first impression that they have would change over time by being in Newport, meeting Newport's inhabitants, but also by traveling to other places in the young United States, as the French would call it at the time. And so I would call Newport, for this particular reason, the cradle of the successful French-American alliance, because Newport became a place where the French and American new allies could start to um, discuss things, they could start to cooperate on different military matters, but also commercial matters or, um, for instance, some cultural exchanges. So you can really see that Newport became a center for the French-American alliance that has been quite understudied as people would also Im always imagine that the French were kind of just waiting there in their encampment, but that is not the case. So I'm going to um, go through the context a little bit before we start to really dig into the the arrival in Newport and what happened there, because maybe you need some refreshing uh, for, the, for the historical context. So as we all know, the start of the American Revolution was of course in 1775, and three years later, the French joined that war because of course they signed the alliance in 1778, which was a military alliance between France with the King Louis XVI, and of course the US Congress that has, had just been founded, let's say. And so the French participated in this American Revolution mainly because they wanted to fight against their arch enemy being Great Britain. So Great Britain, of course, had won the war before the American War of Independence being what you call the Seven Years' War that happened just before that. And so the French had lost most of their territories at the time uh, to the British. And so in order to get their prominent place back on the world stage, French, fr the French thought that joining the American rebels, as they would call them, les rebelles américains, um, by joining these American rebels, they could diminish the power of the British, because of course the British Empire had all these colonies, and by splitting a few of the colonies off, that could mean that um, the British power would diminish and that the French hopefully would come up again. And the French were especially hoping for interesting trade relations with the new United States. There was also some inspiration of this cause for the revolution, the cause for liberty, for equality, uh, for all these kind of promises the revolution held. So some of the French participants were also really engaged in the sort of the larger cause of American independence. But overall, you could really um, argue that it was mainly to take revenge on the British. And so in 1778, already in um, the French king sent a first expedition of l'amiral d'Estaing, so that was mainly a fleet. And you could say it's a failed expedition because most of these combined efforts to fight the British failed and he had to leave. And so in 1780, two years later, a new expedition was sent. And this was the Expeditionary Army of Rochambeau that I'm sure you've all heard about, but I'm gonna give quite some details on that specific expedition today. 
So I'm not going to fo focus on the first one. I'm really focusing on Rochambeau and what he has done in Newport and beyond that. And as a reminder, 1781 was the year that the Yorktown, um, the victory of Yorktown was won. So that was in October of 1781, leading, of course, to the American independence being recognized in 1783 after quite a long period of negotiations about the peace treaty. And so we are going to focus now on, of course, this French troops in Newport. So as you can see on this little timeline, July 1780 until June 1781 is almost a full year. Um, the French did not plan to stay this long, but it kind of just happened to them because they arrived later than they expected and they were waiting for reinforcement that would finally never come. So they were waiting in Newport, but they were also trying to figure out what they could do. And both of these things took a bit more time than they expected. And so they actually stayed for a full year in Newport. Some of the French soldiers got extremely bored in the camp and there are quite some accounts talking about how there was just not, not much to do and they were not allowed to get out of the camp. But for the officers, there was a complete different story. So going to um, the beginnings of this. So you have to imagine that the French expeditionary army of about five and a half thousand men uh, made a big transatlantic crossing with about 40 ships surrounded by seven warships to protect them from a place called Brest in France to Newport. And it took them much longer than expected because there was not much wind and there were lots of diversions because British attacks could have happened. So they had to take a sort of a um, detour. And so it took them exactly 71 days to arrive in Newport. They, by the way, first went to the Chesapeake Bay but thought that was too dangerous. So they sailed to Newport to actually uh, disembark there. And that became very important and necessary for them because most of their soldiers were sick because of the long transatlantic voyage. There was not enough water nor food left. And so people got ill um, and needed, like badly needed to get out. <laughs> so Newport was the destination they chose. And so you can see here how important that was. So what I'm gonna do is use a lot of French testimonies. Some are unpublished, most are published of the beginning, but the second part will be most unpublished. Um, but so French, uh, the French on the, aboard the ships, after 70 days on the water, finally saw the land. So they describe, quite a lot of them describe that they see the land and they finally see America. So here you see Mathieu Dumas, the aide de camp of Rochambeau, saying we had at length reached the country which, so, which we so ardently desired to see. So excitement on board, of course, and two days later, they finally arrive on the shores of Newport, um, after, by the way, going through a thick fog, they describe, so they can't see anything. So for two days, they're advancing towards Newport through these little islands, and they see a little bit of them, but they don't understand really where they are. And so on July 11th, they see it. They know they arrived. And so one of the major generals that's aboard the ship, the, or one of the ships, because there are many, of course, describes that the sun was very hot. So this is July, mid of July. And it was the worst heat I have ever experienced in my life. We arrived in the deserted town of Newport. So the title of this presentation comes from this quote. And so the deserted town of Newport is indeed described by a few others as well. For instance, Labbé Robin who is also on board of the ships, describing that um, the arrival of the army spread a general terror through that place, so to Newport. The fields became major deserts and those who, whose curiosity led to visit Newport could scarcely perceive a human from the street. So apparently the people in Newport left, they, they, they fled out of, of the place they were into their homes. And the reason was that they thought maybe that they were still British because just before the French arrived, <clears throat> Newport had been occupied by the British forces. They had destroyed the city, they had taken all the supplies. And so the inhabitants of Newport were afraid of a new sort of invasion of the British. And so that's when you can see here uh, in one of these uh, testimonies too, that uh, it had been occupied by the British. So the, the French knew this, but so they didn't expect the Newporters to run for their lives. They had actually imagined, as we can see here, for instance, they had imagined a huge reception. They thought when we arrive, we'll have this huge welcome with a cheering crowd with uh, salute guns and everything. But unfortunately for them, it was very disappointing. As we can see, for instance, in another of the testimonies of uh, Guillaume de Depont, who is also one of the officers, and he comments on this. He says, we did not meet with that reception on landing, which we expected. 
The coldness and reserve appear to me to be characteristics of the American nation. They appear to have little of that enthusiasm which one supposes would belong to a people fighting for its liberties. So overall, many of these testimonies exist is when the French had had that long journey, they expected a very fun, nice, festive welcome. And so they were disappointed from the first seconds when, when they came in. One of the reasons was, as I said, the, the fear of, of a new British invasion, but there was also more to it. The French arrived in Newport with um, sort of this baggage of lots of prejudices uh, that the, the um, American inhabitants, and especially those in Newport, had towards them. So thinking about the Seven Years' War, which was, uh, which was um, sort of concluded not long ago, the French had been the enemy of the Americans. The Americans had fought alongside the British in that war, and so now they were out of a sudden welcoming their former enemy. So you can imagine that that is quite complicated for them. On top of it all, the French had already sent the expedition in 1778, and that had not led uh, to any success. So they were thinking, what are they doing here? Again, they're not gonna help us. And on top of that, there was lots of cultural uh, differences and prejudices uh, throughout this period, especially again, coming from the Seven Years' War still, where the British had started a real propaganda campaign against the French. And so there were uh, ideas of the French being effeminate beings that were only preoccupied with curling their hair and painting their faces. It's true that the French aristocrats at the time were always wearing these huge wigs and were wearing indeed makeup, especially um, they were men, but so that's maybe why they would think this. On top, they were also thinking that they were dwarfs and ugly specimens who lived exclusively on frogs and snails. So sort of scary creatures that were eating <laughs> um, quite disgusting things. But there was also a big feeling of anti-Catholicism in New England, Rhode Island at the time, um, because of course, uh, Catholicism was considered uh, the other religion. They were more from uh, Protestant nature, those who were living there. And so there was an idea that there were, the French were sent by the Pope to Catholicize um, the new colonies, or maybe that they wanted to get the colonies. So all in all, you can see all these different ideas circulating in Newport uh, at the time. And so the French were not that welcome. By the way, it's also the case for the other way around. The French also had a very negative image of the Americans overall. Uh, as you can see, they had imagined something maybe a bit more, um, let's say, glorious as what they would expect to welcome them. They didn't. And then they thought they were all um, sort of living. That's what one of the quotes said too. They're living on the peripheries of civilization. So most of these people, especially the officers are commenting, came from Paris from this huge city at the time and then they arrived in a small town so for them they looked down upon them so you can imagine also this this sort of arrogant reaction of the French and that led of course to even more negative reactions of the people from Newport but it also changes because on July 12th so the day of the disembarkation some of the people of Newport are actually being excited. They feel that maybe salvation is about to come. Most started to realize they were not the British, they were the French, those that were in favor of the French. And so they came out of their homes and started to celebrate. So apparently the bell rang for a long time and the city got illuminated by lots of candles to welcome the French troops. So this is maybe a weird shift because of all the things I explained, but you have to of course imagine that there are few are pro-French, other are anti-French. It's of course a, a mix between all this, but it is important to remember these prejudices and negative reactions on both sides in order to understand what will happen next. And so here you can see an image of this welcome where you can see the ships uh, at the background and the generals coming up uh, to salute the people of Newport. And so one of the most important things for the French to do at the beginning was to help all those that were sick. One third of the, of the soldiers were severely ill from their transatlantic journey. There was not enough, as we already said, there was not enough food, not enough water, and especially these ships were cramped with people. So most of these larger ships could actually hold a thousand people, but they were all very small. So if you imagine diseases how, and how they spread, that's of course, a very dangerous environment to be in. And so the hospitals were created, French hospitals in the different churches that you can see that I, I would think still exist today. So all these different uh, churches 
And they also brought them further down to Providence, Bristol, and a place called Pepasqua's Point. Um, and so they had to take care of them by creating hospitals, but also by buying fresh food and fresh water. And that was something they had to do locally because they could not, of course, bring everything. So they had to buy from the local inhabitants food, supplies, everything you can imagine to feed that entire army of, again, 5,000 men and lots of sailors on, on board of the ships as well. And so the French start to um, complain, actually, in, their, in all their testimonies, that everything is very expensive. They have noticed that the country has been destroyed by the British, so they understand that there's just not enough provisions for this entire new army that arrives on the shores of Newport while um, just going back to time too, there are 5,000 inhabitants in Newport and the French army is 5,000 men strong. So out of a double, the, the size doubles. And so lots of food is needed. So there's not enough for, of that. And so it has to come from other places, other states as well. But so it's still very expensive for the French. And it made the French comment on that the Americans love money more than they love their liberty. Um, it's also related to the fact that the French money was worth much more than American money at the time. So it led to high prices and profits for the local inhabitants of Newport that were of course interesting to them. But you can see that this is again, sort of a disappointment for the French because they had expected that their new American allies would welcome them in other ways and not making them pay very high prices. Um, so I'm, I'm giving here some, some quotes of Châtelieu, but there's lots of others that are commenting like Rochambeau himself to saying that there's exorbitant prices and they're worried that they cannot pay it all because they didn't bring enough money. So from the first moments they start to write to the French king to send more money to them in order to pay. And so, as I said, when they arrived, they were a little disappointed, but then they started to make the hospitals, they started to buy provisions, and of course, they have to make encampments for all these soldiers in order to live in Newport, um, but also more specifically to protect themselves against the British. We are in the middle of the war, of course, um, the war has been raging since five years, and the British are everywhere, you could say, and especially their fleet is on the waters. And as soon as they could find out that they're in Newport, there was a serious um, threat of them going to attack the French immediately. So from the first seconds of the arrival, Rochambeau and his staff is going to explore the lands to see where can we build a, a strong encampment and where can we build especially um, a well-fortified encampment to pre prevent the British to attack us. And so they do, they find at the right place um, and has been studied by uh, the historian that is living in Newport, or at least when, when I was there, he was, uh, John Hattendorf has um, precisely laid out where that encampment was. And so it ran from east to west uh, to present day Spring Street, overlooking Easton's Beach. And so this camp was organized in a very efficient way for all these 5,000 soldiers that had arrived. And so in order to um, reduce the longstanding tensions that I just described between Newport's residents and the French, they needed to, um, they, they believed it would have been a good idea to put the officers in the homes of Newport in order to mingle with the local inhabitants and also of course, to be in a comfortable home. Um, and so they paid rent for this. The French repaired buildings and fortifications on their expense in order to create kind of goodwill for the inhabitants of Newport in order to be more welcome and to start to cooperate uh, instead of being suspicious one against another. And so Rochambeau and his staff, about 91 officers and servants, moved into town in the center of Newport. And you can see that still today that the existence homes mostly are now privately owned, but uh, Rochambeau, for instance, lived on Clark Street, Châtelieu lived on Spring Street, um, and some of the aides in, also in Clark Street, and then there was a few others. So this is just examples, but uh, in the existing, home, in existing homes of Newport, the French officers were living. And as we remember, it was for a whole year. So they actually spent a great deal of time in these homes and uh, planned their campaigns, were doing lots of dealings with local inhabitants and were organizing social events as I'll come to, uh, back to later. So what I want to do now is focus on François-Jean de Châtelieu, who was, uh, as I just already had, there are a few quotes, so you, you have heard his name, but he was uh, one of the most crucial figures of the French expeditionary army because he was a major general. So he was serving just under Rochambeau and he was specifically uh, responsible for the logistics 
And especially he was the liaison officer between the American army and the French army because he spoke English, which was very rare amongst the, the high ranking French officers or generals as he was. Um, and he would play a crucial role in, in the whole uh, expedition that the French would do later. Uh, so just as you can see how the, the hierarchy is working here with Châtelieu. And uh, you might notice this um, painting, but he is in the background here. And he's also in the background here on another very famous, of course, Cornwallis surrender at Yorktown. And so Châtelieu has been understudied um, in the history of the French Expeditionary Army. Most people might have heard of Rochambeau, but of course no Lafayette more, who was not serving in the French army, he was serving in directly under uh, Washington in the Continental Army. Um, but here you can see that, of course, he was present at important moments. And so François-Jean de Châtelieu has been a, one of the most like, forgotten figures. Um, here's a quote about that, but mainly because his private archive had been hidden for about 250 years in his family castle in Châtelieu. So this is a picture of that castle that today um, you can visit today. And what's interesting about it is that the same family, so the Châtelieu family has been living for a thousand years in this castle, going from mill to mill, generations on generations and generations. And so today there is someone called Philippe de Châtelieu living here. And together with him, we have discovered the François-Jean de Châtelieu papers. I'm just showing you some images so you have an idea of the beautiful castle it is. <laughs> and so here is the archive tower um, in which we have discovered this collection of all the papers of François-Jean de Châtelieu that had been hidden and especially are unpublished for most part um, that contain a lot of information on the French-American alliance. Here's a um, portrait that they hold there in the castle. And um, the correspondences that are held there are from specifically where I'm talking about today is the American, um, his American campaign. So with Washington, Jefferson, Governor Morris, Knox, Madison, Schuyler, all these American, what you would call founding fathers today, have been writing to him uh, during his campaign and also after. And then there's a whole other side that's very interesting too, is that uh, Châtelieu was not only a military man, he was also a philosopher of the French Enlightenment, which is reflected in other correspondences that he had with French philosophers mainly. And so today what I wanna focus on is his military reports because while in Newport, he was writing a lot. So here we can see uh, a reflection of that. There's multiple reports, but I wanna focus on one. And uh, here we can see it. I would say it's one of the treasures of the Châtelieu papers. And so here you can see the, how it looks, but it's called the memoir on the conditions of the intervention in August, 1780. So we remember that they arrived mid July, they had built their encampment, they had saved um, some of the soldiers that were sick, 200 actually passed away, by the way, so it's quite a large number, but they had put them in the hospitals, the encampment was built, they were relatively safe in their camp. So it became time to reflect on what can we do and, and what is the what is um, the new campaign going to look like. So there's some sun coming up. Um, and so the memoirs of the condition is a memoir he wrote to the French court, to Versailles, to update the French administration on the French situation, but especially to tell how terrible it was. So this is a reflection of what I said, the disappointed arrival in, in the deserted town of Newport, reflected in a report that's unpublished. And what's interesting is that he's, he, you can feel he's almost desperate. He's really afraid of what they're into. So he's saying, we wanted to crush the English and we thought the occasion favorable, but all in all, we have contracted an alliance with rebel subjects. We will have to feed, clothe and pay the Americans and even fight for them. So when in Rhode Island, Châtelieu had been through a few places and only had met the Rhode Island militia. This is because Rhode Island militia was helping the French to build their encampment and Châtelieu was highly disappointed in these militia, mainly because he as a French general was used to being surrounded by people that had uniforms that were well disciplined and that had this specific French training. And in Newport and in Rhode Island, unfortunately, um, the soldiers were not as well closed or like with a beautiful uniform that he was used to. And they had a different type of discipline and they had different types of training. And so uh, in, in his French mind, they were um, sort of rebel subjects that 
could not do much for his well-trained European army. Then he would also say that our aid will not be decisive because it can serve to make it longer, but we cannot do anything. It will be more ruinous for us than for the English since we will be obliged continuously to send new troops and money. So one of the, the main issues that the French had is that they had planned on bringing 7,000 men, but they could only bring 5,000 because there was a lack of ships. And so 2,000 men were still in France and were supposed to be sent over to America. And so the French are waiting for this, but are, are really pushing the, the king to finally send them because it becomes impossible. They know that there are 20,000 British uh, in New York and more around, and they also know that the Continental Army is not that much more than 5,000. So they know they're completely outnumbered. And so they are very well aware that it becomes dangerous. And Chateaudoux concludes that they're duped into the alliance because he believes that Franklin, especially Benjamin Franklin in Paris, negotiating the alliance had embellished the numbers of the Continental soldiers by saying that they had a very large, magnificent army and that they only just needed a few new troops in order to really fight the British. Arriving there made them realize that that was not the case, and so they felt duped into the alliance. And he could just not imagine how 5,000 men that were tired of the sea were put into this own unknown land with five to 6,000 Americans, and that they had to fight against a superior army in very advantageous positions, misses nothing, is used to the climate, and has been fighting the war for five years. So Chateau starts to feel um, afraid of this mission and just doesn't see how to do it. And he is also says that the American army is composed of men with miserable fortunes, badly supplied, badly paid, dangerously prone to desertion. So he continues and continues <laughs> with all these ex sort of complaints about them. And so he has a solution because of course he can uh, conclude that the, the situation is complicated, but he can also find a solution here, which would be we need to do research. We have to work together with the Americans in order to figure out if there's a way we can do something because they still need to fight the British and they still need to find something. They're not gonna stay in Newport and just wait uh, for reinforcements. And so what Chateau proposes is to do um, something which is here you can see, he wants uh, some officers of the army of Rochambeau to travel in the country to see the army and measure the disposition of the people. And he needs to reassemble, as he says, accurate information on the Continental Army, on the British Army, on the American lands, on the possibilities for provisions, on the possibilities for battlefields, on the former battlefields had to be studied to understand where are we, what can we do? And so he proposes a sort of reconnaissance mission in the American lands as a solution for their problems because what, they, what he especially believes is that don't have enough information in order to fight their war, because he knows that there's not enough men, but there might be a solution for that. And so this is gonna happen. Um, and here you can see a, a letter that he wrote to his sister where he's really complaining and saying that he is gonna pretend that he's sick in order to be able to go back to France. And he also sent that to the French king saying, I'm very sick, can I please leave? And so what's funny is that a year later he receives the answer of the French king and that's when they're in the middle of the Yorktown campaign when Chateau is of course at sort of the height of his military glory so he really doesn't want to leave anymore so we can feel this this change coming and so the change is happening because out of Newport Chateau is going to travel and so of course um after all this, so he was writing this report in August, but in September of, uh, of 1780, the Hartford Conference takes place. So Rochambeau will go to Hartford to meet Washington for the first time to determine what they could do together. Um, and so Chateau had just proposed to do more research, but they're discussing that there are two options. One would be to attack New York uh, because that's where the British power is, the, the center of the British power. But then another would be to go to the Chesapeake Bay. So already at this time, both generals are considering the two options, but they know that for both operations, they will need more men and they specifically need the French fleet. And so they propose to wait for the reinforcement, but they also agree uh, that Chateau and some of the officers, uh, so French officers combined with American officers will go for this expedition together. And so what's especially interesting is that this is not only a moment of military planning, it's also a moment of sort of forging this alliance and, and 
creating sort of a cement to the alliance of social contacts. And this is where it becomes interesting of it's becoming a moment where they become friends, where they become to develop trust one in another, and that the prejudices start to fade away and make place for trust and um, admiration. And uh, yeah, we could call it real friendships between a few of these French and Americans that are gonna travel together through different states. And so this really leads to newfound hope. And so we are gonna leave Newport a little, but we'll come back to it quickly after again. So within this, what you call reconnaissance expedition uh, of 1780, it starts in November and goes on until about March and will continue again later. Um, you can really feel that the French start to feel newfound hope. So what they had seen in Rhode Island being a destroyed country, you have to again, imagine it was occupied by the British, it was destroyed and there was only a militia that they had found. So they, they felt disillusioned, but by going to other places, they could see that there was a serious potential for success. And this reconnaissance expedition has stayed rather unknown because most of the reports of it are kept in Châteauleux's archive. So this is what I'm mainly working on uh, right now. And so there is a group of people, Châteauleux is accompanied by a few Frenchmen um, of whose names you might never have heard of, but they also traveled with Lafayette himself. <clears throat> so the Marquis de Lafayette with medicine so, uh, and with Schuyler, Knox and George Washington himself. So they created a group and not everyone was all the time together, but sometimes the French expedition would meet with Lafayette, then with Madison, then with Schuyler, then with Knox and so on. So there was a, a group that was constantly changing, but the idea was that the French and Americans had to cooperate to reassemble all the information that they could find in order to wage their war against the British. And so from Rhode Island, they went to Connecticut, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, Delaware, Massachusetts, and Virginia. So they did quite a long tour and they traveled a lot and wrote everything down. So all their the things they have seen, observed, the land that they've seen, uh, they, they observed and made reports on it. And these reports are very interesting because it also gives a very clear image of the different states of the United States of the time, and especially gives you a, a very good overview of all the inhabitants, for instance, they were counting how many inhabitants are they, because how many can we possibly recruit? Uh, how is the state of the agriculture? Because it's for provisions. What kind of even religions are there? Because we have to understand who our ally is. They had, to, of course, understand who the enemy was, where they were, and so on. And so during this reconnaissance mission, they discovered the military potential of America. So instead of being sort of disillusioned and, and full of fear, they could see that among the men I have met with above 20 years of age, whatsoever conditions, I have not found two who have not borne arms, heard the whistling of bullets and even received some wounds. It may be asserted that North America is entirely inured to war and that new levies may continually be made. So of course that's an interesting quote because before they thought they were lost, <laughs> there was no one. Another point is interesting is when he visited, uh, visited West, West Point with this French and American sort of group, um, where he's very impressed by the, the, the rapidity and the, 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 how fast the, the Americans had uh, built their fortifications. So he says, two years ago, West Point was an almost inaccessible wilderness, which has since then been covered with fortresses and artillery by people who six years before had scarcely even seen cannon. So they become impressed. This is Châteauleux, but he's with the other French as well. And they become impressed by what they see there. And one of the most impressive parts is the land. So again, Rhode Island was quite devastated by the war, but other places are less so. And so he, could, he sees whatever mountains I have climbed, whatever furs I've traversed, whatever bypass I have fellow, followed, I have never traveled three miles without meeting with this new settlement, either beginning to take form or already under cultivation. So he's amazed by how fast everything is growing, what the potential is for, first of all, agriculture for his own army, but also in the future, he's imagining this wide land of a huge continent that can be filled with agriculture and can become a very important market um, or at least trade partner for France. He's hoping that. That's another subject, but it's interesting as well. And then the real turning point comes when Châteauleux meets the grand George Washington. George Washington and him meet in November. So after that conference that Washington had with, um, with Rochambeau during this reconnaissance mission. So uh, Washington is uh, at the time based in 
um, New Jersey in the place in Cape Cod that they mentioned still to be visited today, where he had his headquarters at the time. And the two meet and they spend a few days together of which there's a very large description. But what's especially interesting is that for Châtelieu and the officers he's with, this general will, will mean that the French can actually start to win this new campaign because with such a leader, they cannot imagine that um, they can lose. <laughs> and it's quite interesting because all the French officers are completely under sort of the spell of George Washington, you could say. They consider him sort of the best of men and Châtelieu specifically believes, <clears throat> believes that. And his vision was already started to change over the, over the weeks of observation of all these things I just mentioned. But when he meets Washington, he's convinced that it could work. And this is not only uh, Châtelieu that is in, in admiration of George Washington for the qualities he has as a leader, but also the qualities he had as sort of this gentleman farmer um, and so on, but especially Châtelieu, uh, receives the same kind of admiration and they start a, a long conversation and especially long um, epistolary exchanges because until the end of Chatelier's life in 1788 they they exchange lots of letters and this is one of these letters that was kept in Chatelier's archive where Washington tells Chatelier that he had developed a deep and lasting friendship with him a friendship which neither time nor distance can ever eradicate I can truly say that never in my life did I part with a man to whom my soul clave more sincerely than it did to you. So this is uh, an impressive letter because George Washington was not used to send this kind of language to people at the time, especially not to, um, to anyone else but his wife, actually. Um, he would, of course, uh, in his correspondence, he always was quite sort of strict. And out of a sudden here with this Frenchman, he becomes extremely <laughs> overwhelmingly enthusiastic it's also of course the time period where men used to write these kind of things but here you can really see another level reached with Châtelieu which is uh, partially based on um, the fact that Châtelieu was also besides being a military man a philosopher of the enlightenment and, and Washington was extremely interested in that side of him anyway not the point of this lecture but it's an interesting change you can see uh, from this despair they feel in Newport when arriving to this newfound hope based on their observations and by the French-American cooperation leading to friendships such as this one. Um, and so the result of this mission um, can be summarized in what I said from, from, hope, from despair to hope. So there's hope not only for the French but also for these Americans that have seen the, fr the French experienced officers traveling around and observing so again, it's just a small group. So we're talking about, about 10 um, French and Americans. They call themselves, by the way, the Gallo American group of literally military researchers. But this really makes a difference for their cooperation because instead of being kind of suspicious one against another, try to manipulating the other side and so on, they're deciding we're gonna work together. We know what we have in common and we are forgetting what we don't have in common. And by organizing, especially their reconnaissance mission, they also organize a lot of social events. And that's where I want to uh, focus on a little bit more now, and also will end with, is this social part of, of this cooperation, which we tend to forget, because most of the time you think of military strategy planning or something of like, okay, you're right, you draw maps and then you draw reports. But of course, there's also lots of social interaction. And the importance of trust between allies is not to be underestimated. And one of these moments where that will start is, of course, during social events such as dinners, but also bowls that the French were organizing with the Americans. For instance, when they go into Philadelphia, they organize a lot of grand bowls with the, the Philadelphia Society and the French officers. And it leads to new friendships, new romances, of course, too. Um, but also uh, to realize that the French are not that different from the Americans and vice versa. So it's an important moment this winter of 1780-81 to, to kind of forge this alliance together and to create this mutual trust between them through social contacts. And that's also what's happening in the meantime, of course, in, um, in Newport, but uh, overall, oh yeah, this is something I wanted to mention too, is that Châtelieu feels there is potential, but we remain convinced that the Americans were doomed to destruction and that the alliance with French could only, with France, sorry, could only affect their salvation. 
So the French are badly needed in order to support the Americans, but they're also, they have their own strength, but they need the French experience because of course the British mighty army is one of these well-trained European armies, just like the French. So they will need the French, but they can make it with the Americans together. And so th this expedition, these, the few officers I mentioned, uh, so Chateau and his followers, let's say, come back to Newport. And what they do for a long time in winter is they, they write down, so they come back, by the way, in January of uh, 1781, um, and they describe their last part of the trip by going on sleighs. They have to go literally through the snow, and it's very cold and lots of snow everywhere. They go through sleighs back to, to Newport, and that's when they start to write all their reports that are now kept in the Châtelieu papers. Um, but they also continue to build their relationships with the people of Newport. And one of the most important moments of this is when they receive George Washington. And I'm sure you've heard about this moment uh, in time where Newport is the sort of welcoming ground of George Washington himself. Uh, on March 6th, 1781, he visits his French allies and the inhabitants of Newport um, on an occasion that is actually that he needs the French for a specific expedition. So I won't go into details about the expedition itself, but he's also there to, to welcome the French soldiers. This is the first time he comes to the French encampment and to visit, of course, all the French officers that are living in Newport. The reason is specifically that they need to start the new campaigning season, winter being the moment of rest in the winter camps. But of course, March is the moment when you start to plan the new campaign, being the campaign of 1781, that would finally lead, of course, to their victory. And so what is, interesting to think is when George Washington arrives, the French army is in full sort of splendor uh, to welcome their, their general in chief, so the, the highest general of their entire expedition. And so here they, you can see the, the quote of a local inhabitant that is describing this, saying that they're um, all lifting their hats and their caps, waving of standards, a sea of plumes, long line of French soldiers and the general description of their arm was unique to us. That the people of Newport are really impressed by these magnificent French soldiers that are welcoming the Grand General George Washington. And so you can also see that they were organizing uh, with the lines, so the, the French were standing around the, the roads of Newport, all aligned uh, to welcome George Washington. The town was illuminated, a procession was formed, and they were organizing a grand ball for this evening. And of course, people were carrying, like boys were carrying little candles behind them in a procession. So the reason was, of course, to discuss the next campaign with George Washington. And they decided to send a little expedition to the Chesapeake Bay in March already, which failed and is not, a, not the point of this lecture. So I will not go on about it. But the, the George Washington wanted to kind of take revenge on Arnold, the traitor, and so needed the French to help him and to stop a specific uh, mission that they had in the South. So this was um, the moment for the French fleet to go out of Newport to go to the Chesapeake Bay, but they were too late and they kind of had to return. But still it was, it was an important moment because it was one of the first French American expeditions and the French had the occasion to observe Chesapeake Bay, which was useful as you can imagine later in the Battle of Yorktown and the Chesapeake Bay. Um, but what I want to focus specifically on is that Newport also became this place, as was already the case, uh, starting from the beginning where the French and Americans started to uh, have dinners together, start to cooperate. As I said, they needed to buy provisions. So there were lots of interactions, commercial interactions, leading to friendships between the French and Americans there. And so, for instance, when Washington is invited by Châtelieu in his home, the Maudsley House, uh, of which I have a photo here. This is apparently, or maybe you know better, obviously, but this is online. You could see how this looks, which looks quite contemporary for 18th century Châtelieu's um, home. Anyway, so he invited George Washington at his home and apparently invited 45 guests of whom most were from Newport High Society, as you would describe them, but also French guests. And for the occasion, he had, he had ordered French wines from France, obviously from Bordeaux more specifically, which was considered the most exquisite French wine. He brought all his silverware as well. And this party was as large as it was apparently even known in Versailles because people wrote letters to the court to say how splendid this dinner had been. 
Um, and so these kind of events, of course, are very important also for the local inhabitants of Newport because out of a sudden they sit on the table with these French officers with George Washington. And most people that were invited here were the, of course, the, the elite of Newport. They were mingling as they were the, the merchants, they were the lawyers and so on. Um, but it had, of course, a large impact on the inhabitants there. There's another description of um, Ezra Stiles, who, who would actually be the, the president of the College of Yale at the university now, uh, who also describes one of these dinners at Chateauneuf's place, dined at the general in splendid manner on 35 dishes. And so what is, I think, an underestimated event or maybe thing in, in war, maybe in general, is that dinners and the social gatherings, of course, are very important because people would not only discuss the war, they would start to exchange on lots of other subjects. So the war could serve as, a, as an expansion or at least a, a sort of um, trends, trends how, how do you say that, a way of exchanging lots of ideas between the French and the Americans. And uh, so lots of cultural exchanges were done exchanges of science, for instance, scientific discoveries, all these different things were discussed around these tables. But what was, of course, especially discussed was the military alliance and what could be done against these British. Um, it was also the occasion for social events in Newport, um, being, of course, some more romantic stories. So this is um, more a funny anecdote to maybe stop with, but um, there is a, a, a person that you might have heard of called Anne Oliphant Vernon, Vernon uh, so the daughter of, I have to look that up, of Samuel Vernon and Emmy Vernon, um, who fell in love with Châteauneuf. And she writes to him, if ever it becomes customary for ladies to serve as aide de camp, I shall certainly solicit for a place with you. And may I expect to gain it, I fear so great a number will apply that I shall be excluded. Um, it appears in their letters that there's been a little romance between the two. She was a little, for according to our standard today, too young <laughs> compared to him. She was around 17 years old while he was in his 50s. Um, but this is an example of the, the local uh, interactions of these with the French officers leading even to the romantic, uh, more romantic stories. Um, and so what it also led to, so I, again, it's in, social, social gatherings are important for exchanges, they're important for trust, they're important for military planning. They were also important for this change in the minds of the people of Newport from this prejudices they had before to sort of more admiration and even just acceptance of the French. You can see that here um, from a, a lawyer of Newport, William Channing, saying that the French troops are a fine body of men and they appear to be well officered. Neither officers nor men are the effeminate beings we were here, here though for taught to believe them. They are as large, so they were not small eating frogs, they're large and likely men as can be produced by any nation. So this, the, the whole change can be perceived here from this, the first prejudices, um, the first prejudices that the Americans held against the French, but also the French accepting them more and to have all these, um, interactions that they had leading to what you could see here, leading to, for instance, during the Weathersfield Conference, uh, where I won't, of course, talk about much more, but <laughs> the, in, during the Weatherfield Conference, uh, decisions were made to move the troops from, um, the French troops from Newport to, uh, to New York and from New York to the South, leading, of course, to their main decision of going to Yorktown. Um, the fact that they went to Yorktown and that the French and Americans started to really work together to figure out, can we, can we do New, New York or not? Can we go to Newport or not? So these, these bigger planning was all done in Newport already. Um, and what is often assumed is that the decision of going to Yorktown was made in July or August specifically of 1781. But with all these reconnaissance missions that were held in the winter, um, you could see that most of this planning was actually already done in Newport when the French came back and made all their reports and calculations. They could really find that New York was a dangerous place to attack and that they should move forward. And so you could consider Newport being sort of this cradle of the success of the French-American alliance, but also the cradle of the decision making of going to Yorktown, which of course was a crucial decision making. <laughs> 
And that's why I would say Newport is, of course, this place where from despair it went to hope because of these reconnaissance missions, but also because of the social interactions between these two people. And also, of course, as I just said, the sort of, let's call it the cradle of successful French-American alliance. Thank you so much, Iris. That was really fascinating. Um, if anyone has any questions, now is a great time to type them into the chat feature and we can share them. Um, Doug Smith asks, do you know where Washington stayed when he was in Newport? Mm, good question. Um, I do not know that, but I would assume in one of these bigger homes, but I should look that up because I don't know. But I know he, he stayed at, for, for dinners, he was invited in different places uh, with the French officers, but where he stayed himself, maybe someone who's listening now knows that. Well, I'm going to put in a little plug for one of our walking tours called uh, George Washington's Footsteps. That's actually a topic that um, we cover on that tour because there um, has not been uh, too, too much concrete evidence down, but there is some, there are some ideas about that. So uh, okay. John asks, was Rochambeau at the same level as Washington in the French army? So yes, he was because he was the general. Um, so gen yeah, so there are two different armies. So as such, he was on the same rank as Washington. But in the specific expedition, Rochambeau was put under Washington. So you could consider Washington being the, the what in French would be called l'excellent, so the sort of the real general of the expedition, and Rochambeau was put under his orders. The French king had done this specifically because if uh, Washington and uh, Rochambeau would have been on the same level, the alliance could not work, according to the king, because you had to be subdued to Washington's orders in order to make it a success. So it was one of the conditions of the alliance that Washington would be on top and made decisions, which also meant that uh, Washington had to, or was giving direct orders and Rochambeau had to respect these orders. So um, at one point when Washington really wanted to go to New York and Rochambeau didn't want that, he still would have had to listen to Washington if he had given the orders to do so. Uh, Elizabeth asks, were there other long-term friendships that grew out of the French time in Newport? So yes, there, there are quite a few testimonies of other friendships. Um, I, should, I should look up the names of the, like very locally in Newport specifically, um, but there's a lot of friendships that have been uh, sort of started between the French and American officers that you can see through their correspondences because some of them stay in touch after the expedition, meaning they, they don't have a reason necessarily to write to each other anymore, but they still do. Um, and what's also interesting is that, of course, there is this society called the Society of the Cincinnati that's founded to, to celebrate the French-American relations. And a few American officers come to Paris, for instance, and there's, there's a lot of exchanges that keep on continuing even after. But it has to be said that the French-American friendships uh, are on a very personal level because in a sort of more political national level, the, the relationship between France and America start to deteriorate quite a bit just after the alliance. So around 1783, the Americans turn back to the British as for their trade. And then the French feel a little betrayed by that. And there is even sort of a quasi war it's called starting between the two. And then when the French revolution breaks out, um, it becomes even worse. So it's, uh, it's, it's friendships based on sort of the, the mutual necessity of fighting the British, leading to actual friendships, but then it stays quite individual. Marion asks, who were some of the individuals at dinner that famous evening? Uh, so that, that's another thing that I do not know. I'm, I would love to find a, an account saying who exactly was president. I do know that Rochambeau, Washington, and Chateau were present, and so I can imagine who the ones invited in France were, uh, from France were, because they're always together, to sort of a group. But as for the local uh, people from um, from Newport, I just don't know because there is no list. But I do know that there's a few letters to Chateau from certain people from Newport being specifically the merchants because he had to work with them a lot. Um, so I can assume that they were there too but I don't have proof, unfortunately. Uh, John asks, would you comment on Admiral de Ternay's funeral in respect to the religious differences, Catholics and Protestants? Yes, so de Ternay was the Admiral, just for general information, the, uh, uh, the, sorry, Admiral de Ternay was the Admiral of the French fleet that had accompanied the, the French expeditionary forces 
And so he died of a disease while in Newport. And so he was buried at, a, at the church. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's called the Trinity Church where he was buried. And so there is now a plaque commemorating that. Um, and so his funeral, so the, I think the question is mainly on if, if it was like a Catholic kind of mass made for that specific funeral, or if it was more um, done through the local customs. Um, but it was really a Catholic mass because the French were Catholic and they were holding these masses. Actually, every Sunday there was Catholic mass ho held in different places in Newport. And the funeral as such was also organized in that way. Um, a different John asks, was the French army invited to America? What was the basis of the French coming specifically to Newport as opposed to some other area in America? Good question. Uh, so they had, when they were sailing towards America, there was a whole plan of where are we going? And Lafayette himself already came before to kind of prepare the grounds for the French to arrive together with George Washington and together with someone called La Luzerne, who was the French ambassador based in Philadelphia. And so they were thinking, what is the most strategic place to arrive? And they first had said, go to Chesapeake Bay, but then the British fleets blocked that bay. So they had to move further. And another option would have been Boston, but that was also considered too dangerous. And so they went to Newport because of the idea that it was a safer place to go to. And also because it was easy to, to kind of um, protect from eventual attacks because it was sort of really protected by land. Um, and it could be done in certain ways that Lafayette had uh, really found out before. So the advice was to go to Newport, um, but it was not the first choice. Um, Patricia uh, asks, did Chastelou have a relationship with Lafayette after the war, once back in France in terms of uh, the work to establish French democracy? Um, so relating to French democracy, um, so for, yeah, almost, but Chastelou died in 1788, so a little too early to really help within the French Revolution. Um, however, they were related because Chatelou was the uncle of Lafayette's wife. Uh, I will not explain the entire thing. It's a very complicated family tree. But so they, they knew each other from a young age. So as soon as Lafayette married um, into Chatelou's family, you could say, um, so the, the Noailles family, Adrien de Noailles is the name of his wife. And so Chatelou was very related to the Noailles family through other family ties. And so from the beginnings of that marriage, they were very close uh, to each other. They keep, they, they met a lot in France and then they, they met a lot in America too. They wrote to each other a lot as well. So there's a lot of testimonies of this. And what I really particularly find interesting is that Lafayette shares with Chateau all his fears. So the fear when he's in, in Virginia, <clears throat> he really fears Cornwallis. And he, he says something like, Cornwallis causes me devilish fear and I'm trembling at the idea of having to fight. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm a major general, but I don't have the experience. Help me. So that's really what he's writing. Um, so they have this special bond that uh, Lafayette would normally not really express that kind of fears. Um, and so after the war, they see each other a lot uh, in Paris as well. And then about democracies and ideas, what's interesting is that Chateau is preparing a book before he dies. He dies unexpectedly of this lung issue, um, but he's writing a book called um, On the New Order of Things. So he wants to uh, he wants to reform France based on an American example by creating a mixed constitution, a mixed, sorry, a mixed constitutional system, which for him means that there is still a mixed monarchy. So the, the monarchy would be balanced by kind of a parliament. So it's not necessarily republicanism as in America, but it's kind of a mixed form between a monarchy and a republic that he wants to create. Um, and so he's really thinking about what is a democracy, who should be able to vote, how can we organize that? How do we reform France in a way that will work, but it will not change it too much? And so he's really inspired by America for that. And that's also the case of Lafayette. So they, they're quite like-minded on these ideas. It looks like that is our last question. So I think it's gonna wrap things up for this evening, but thank you so much for sharing your expertise. And we are very excited to host you for our talk uh, next month in April. Thank so. you so much. <laughs>